The Man with the Gash by Jack London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Man with the Gash by Jack London. Jacob Kent had suffered from cupidity all the days of his life. This, in turn, had engendered a chronic distrustfulness, and his mind and character had become so warped that he was a very disagreeable man to deal with. He was also a victim to somnambulic propensities, and very set in his ideas. He had been a weaver of cloth from the cradle, until the fever of Klondike had entered his blood and torn him away from his loom. His cabin stood midway between Sixty Mile Post and the Stuart River, and men who made it accustomed to travel the trail to Dawson likened him to a robber baron perched in his fortress and exacting toll from the caravans that used his ill-kept roads. Since a certain amount of history was required in the construction of this figure, the less cultured wayfarers from Stuart River were prone to describe him after a still more primordial fashion in which command of strong adjectives was to be chiefly noted. This cabin was not his, by the way, having been built several years previously by a couple of miners who had got out a raft of logs at that point for a grub stake. They had been most hospitable lads, and, after they abandoned it, travelers who knew the route made it an object to arrive there at nightfall. It was very handy, saving them all the time and toil of pitching camp and it was an unwritten rule that the last man left a neat pile of firewood for the next comer. Rarely a night passed, but from half a dozen to a score of men crowded into its shelter. Jacob Kent noted these things, exercised squatter sovereignty, and moved in. Thenceforth, the weary travelers were mulcted a dollar per head for the privilege of sleeping on the floor, Jacob Kent weighing the dust and never failing to steal the downweight. Besides, he so contrived that his transient guests chopped his wood for him and carried his water. This was rank piracy, but his victims were an easy-going breed, and while they detested him, they yet permitted him to flourish in his sins. One afternoon in April he sat by his door, for all the world like a predatory spider, marveling at the heat of the returning sun and keeping an eye on the trail for prospective flies. The Yukon lay at his feet, a sea of ice, disappearing around two great bends to the north and south, and stretching an honest two miles from bank to bank. Over its rough breast ran the sled trail, a slender sunken line, eighteen inches wide and two thousand miles in length, with more curses distributed to the linear foot than any other road in or out of all Christendom. Jacob Kent was feeling particularly good that afternoon. The record had been broken the previous night, and he had sold his hospitality to no less than twenty-eight visitors. True, it had been quite uncomfortable, and four had snored beneath his bunk all night. But then it had added appreciable weight to the sack in which he kept his gold dust. That sack, with its glittering yellow treasure, was at once the chief delight and the chief bane of his existence. Heaven and hell lay within its slender mouth. In the nature of things, there being no privacy to his one-roomed dwelling, he was tortured by a constant fear of theft. It would be very easy for these bearded, desperate-looking strangers to make away with it. Often he dreamed that such was the case, and awoke in the grip of nightmare. A select number of these robbers haunted him through his dreams, and he came to know them quite well, especially the bronzed leader with the gash on his right cheek. This fellow was the most persistent of the lot, and, because of him, he had, in his waking moments, constructed several score of hiding places in and about the cabin. After a concealment, he would breathe freely again, perhaps for several nights only to collar the man with the gash in the very act of unearthing the sack. Then, on awakening in the midst of the usual struggle, he would at once get up and transfer the bag to a new and more ingenious crypt. 
It was not that he was the direct victim of these phantasms, but he believed in omens and thought transference, and he deemed these dream robbers to be the astral projection of real personages who happened at those particular moments, no matter where they were in the flesh, to be harboring designs in the spirit upon his wealth. So he continued to bleed the unfortunates who crossed his threshold, and at the same time to add to his trouble with every ounce that went into the sack. As he sat sunning himself, a thought came to Jacob Kent that brought him to his feet with a jerk. The pleasures of life had culminated in the continual weighing and re-weighing of his dust, but a shadow had been thrown upon this pleasant avocation, which he had hitherto failed to brush aside. His gold scales were quite small. In fact, their maximum was a pound and a half, eighteen ounces, while his hoard mounted up to something like three and a third times that. He had never been able to weigh it all at one operation, and hence considered himself to have been shut out from a new and most edifying coin of contemplation. Being denied this, half the pleasure of possession had been lost. Nay, he felt that this miserable obstacle actually minimized the fact, as it did the strength of possession. It was the solution of this problem flashing across his mind that had just brought him to his feet. He searched the trail carefully in either direction. There was nothing in sight, so he went inside. In a few seconds he had the table cleared away and the scales set up. On one side he placed the stamped discs to the equivalent of fifteen ounces and balanced it with dust on the other. Replacing the weights with dust, he then had thirty ounces precisely balanced. These, in turn, he placed together on one side and again balanced with more dust. By this time the gold was exhausted, and he was sweating liberally. He trembled with ecstasy, ravished beyond measure. Nevertheless, he dusted the sack thoroughly, to the last least grain, till the balance was overcome and one side of the scales sank to the table. Equilibrium, however, was restored by the addition of a penny weight and five grains to the opposite side. He stood, head thrown back, transfixed. The sack was empty, but the potentiality of the scales had become immeasurable. Upon them he could weigh any amount, from the tiniest grain to pounds upon pounds. Mammon laid hot fingers on his heart. The sun swung on its westering way till it flashed through the open doorway, full upon the yellow-burdened scales. The precious heaps, like the golden breasts of a bronze Cleopatra, flung back the light in a mellow glow. Time and space were not. God blimey, but you have the making of several quid there, haven't you? Jacob Kent wheeled about, at the same time reaching for his double-barreled shotgun, which stood handy. But when his eyes lit on the intruder's face, he staggered back dizzily. It was the face of the man with the gash. The man looked at him curiously. Oh, that's all right, he said, waving his hand deprecatingly. You needn't think as I'll arm you or your blasted dust. You're a rum un, you are, he added reflectively, as he watched the sweat pouring from off Kent's face and the quavering of his knees. Why don't you pipe up and say something? He went on as the other struggled for breath. What's gone wrong, you gaff? Anything the matter? What, what, where'd you get it? Kent at last managed to articulate, raising a shaking forefinger to the ghastly scar which seamed the other's cheek. Shipmate stove me down with a marlin spike from the main royal. And now, as you have your figure red and trim, what I want to know is, what's it to you? That's what I want to know. What's it to you, God blimey? Do it hurt you? Ain't it smug enough for the likes of you? That's what I want to know. No, no, Kent answered, sinking upon a stool with a sickly grin. I was just wondering, did you ever see the like? The other went on truculently. No. Ain't it a beaut? Yes. Kent nodded his head approvingly, intent on humoring this strange visitor, but wholly unprepared for the outburst which was to follow his effort to be agreeable. You blasted, bloomin' burgoo eaten son of a sea swab! What do you mean a saying the most unsightly thing God Almighty ever put on the face of man is a butte? What do you mean, you? 
and thereat this fiery son of a sea broke off into a string of oriental profanity, mingling gods and devils, lineages and men, metaphors and monsters, with so savage a virility that Jacob Kent was paralyzed. He shrank back, his arms lifted as though to ward off physical violence. So utterly unnerved was he, that the other paused in the mid-swing of a gorgeous peroration and bust into thunderous laughter. The suns knocked the bottom out of the trail, said the man with the gash, between departing paroxysms of mirth. And I only hope as you'll appreciate the opportunity of consorting with a man of my mug. Get steam up in that firebox of yourn. I'm going to unrig the dogs and grub em. And don't be shy of the wood, my lad. There's plenty more where that come from. And it's you've got the time to sling an axe. And tow up a bucket of water while you're about it. Lively, or I'll run you down, so help me. Such a thing was unheard of. Jacob Kent was making the fire, chopping wood, packing water, doing menial tasks for a guest. When Jim Cardigie left Dawson, it was with his head filled with the iniquities of this roadside Shylock, and all along the trail his numerous victims had added to the sum of his crimes. Now, Jim Cardigie, with the sailor's love for a sailor's joke, had determined, when he pulled into the cabin, to bring its inmate down a peg or so. That he had succeeded beyond expectation he could not help but remark, though he was in the dark as to the part the gash on his cheek had played in it. But while he could not understand, he saw the terror it created, and resolved to exploit it as remorselessly as would any modern trader a choice bit of merchandise. Strike me blind, but you're a usla, he said admiringly, his head cocked to one side as his host bustled about. You never ought to have gone Klondiking. It's the keeper of a pub you was laid out for. And it's often as I have heard the lads up and down the river speak of you. But I hadn't no idea you was so jolly nice. Jacob Kent experienced a tremendous yearning to try his shotgun on him. But the fascination of the gash was too potent. This was the real man with the gash. The man who had so often robbed him in the spirit. This, then, was the embodied entity of the being whose astral form had been projected into his dreams, the man who had so frequently harbored designs against his horde. Hence, there could be no other conclusion. This man with the gash had now come into the flesh to dispossess him. And that gash! He could no more keep his eyes from it than stop the beating of his heart. Try as he would, they wandered back to that one point as inevitably as the needle to the pole. Do it hurt you, Jim Cardigie thundered suddenly, looking up from the spreading of his blankets and encountering the rapt gaze of the other. It strikes me as how it'd be the proper thing for you to draw your jib, douse the glim, and turn in, seeing as how it were it's you. Just lay to that, you swab, or so help me I'll take a pull on your peak purchases. Kent was so nervous that it took three puffs to blow out the slush lamp, and he crawled into his blankets without even removing his moccasins. The sailor was soon snoring lustily from his hard bed on the floor, but Kent lay staring up into the blackness, one hand on the shotgun, resolved not to close his eyes the whole night. He had not had an opportunity to secrete his five pounds of gold, and it lay in the ammunition box at the head of his bunk. But, try as he would, he at last dozed off with the weight of his dust heavy on his soul. Had he not inadvertently fallen asleep with his mind in such condition, the somnambulic demon would not have been invoked, nor would Jim Cardigie have gone mining next day with a dishpan. The fire fought a losing battle and at last died away, while the frost penetrated the mossy chinks between the logs and chilled the inner atmosphere. The dogs outside ceased their howling, and, curled up in the snow, dreamed of salmon-stocked heavens where dog drivers and kindred taskmasters were not. Within, a sailor lay like a log, while his host tossed restlessly about, the victim of strange fantasies. As midnight drew near, he suddenly threw off the blankets and got up. It was remarkable that he could do what he then did without ever striking a light. Perhaps it was because of the darkness that he kept his eyes shut, 
and perhaps it was for fear he would see the terrible gash on the cheek of his visitor. But, be this as it may, it is a fact that, unseeing, he opened his ammunition box, put a heavy charge into the muzzle of the shotgun without spilling a particle, rammed it down with double wads, and then put everything away and got back into bed. Just as daylight laid its steel-gray fingers on the parchment window, Jacob Kent awoke. Turning on his elbow, he raised the lid and peered into the ammunition box. Whatever he saw, or whatever he did not see, exercised a very peculiar effect upon him, considering his neurotic temperament. He glanced at the sleeping man on the floor, let the lid down gently, and rolled over on his back. It was an unwanted calm that rested on his face. Not a muscle quivered. There was not the least sign of excitement or perturbation. He lay there a long while, thinking, and when he got up and began to move about, it was in a cool, collected manner, without noise and without hurry. It happened that a heavy wooden peg had been driven into the ridge pole just above Jim Cardigie's head. Jacob Kent, working softly, ran a piece of half-inch manila over it, bringing both ends to the ground. One end he tied about his waist, and in the other he rove a running noose. Then he cocked his shotgun and laid it within reach by the side of numerous moosehide thongs. By an effort of will he bore the sight of the scar, slipped the noose over the sleeper's head, and drew it taut by throwing back on his weight at the same time seizing the gun and bringing it to bear. Jim Cardigie awoke, choking, bewildered, staring down the twin wells of steel. Where is it? Kent asked, at the same time slacking on the rope. You blast it! Ugh! Kent merely threw back his weight, shutting off the other's wind. Bloomin' burr! Ugh! Where is it? Kent repeated. What? Cardigie asked, as soon as he had caught his breath. The gold dust. What gold dust? The perplexed sailor demanded. You know well enough. Mine. Ain't seen nothing of it. What do you take me for, a safe deposit? What have I got to do with it anyhow? Maybe you know, and maybe you don't. But anyway, I'm going to stop your breath till you do know. And if you lift a hand, I'll blow your head off. Fast heaven! Cardigie roared as the rope tightened. Kent eased away a moment, and the sailor, wriggling his neck as though from the pressure, managed to loosen the noose a bit and work it up so the point of contact was just under the chin. Well, Kent questioned, expecting the disclosure, but Cardigie grinned. Go ahead with your angin, you bloomin' old pot wallaba! Then, as the sailor had anticipated, the tragedy became a farce. Cardigie being the heavier of the two, Kent, throwing his body backward and down, could not lift him clear of the ground. Strain and strive to the uttermost, the sailor's feet still stuck to the floor and sustained a part of his weight. The remaining portion was supported by the point of contact just under his chin. Failing to swing him clear, Kent clung on, resolved to slowly throttle him or force him to tell what he had done with the hoard but the man with the gash would not throttle. Five, ten, fifteen minutes passed, and at the end of that time, in despair, Kent let his prisoner down. Well, he remarked, wiping away the sweat, if you won't hang, you'll shoot. Some men wasn't born to be hanged anyway. And it's a pretty mess as you'll make o' this eared cabin floor. Cardigie was fighting for time. Now look here. I'll tell you what we do. We'll lay our heads alongside and reason together. You've lost some dust. You say as how I know, and I say as how I don't. Let's get a observation and shape a course. Vast heaven, Kent dashed in, maliciously imitating the other's enunciation. I'm going to shape all the courses of this shebang, and you observe. And if you do anything more, I'll bore you as sure as Moses. For the sake of my mother, whom God have mercy upon if she loves you. Ah, would you? He frustrated a hostile move on the part of the other by pressing the cold muzzle against his forehead. Lay quiet now. If you lift as much as a hair, you'll get it. 
It was rather an awkward task, with the trigger of the gun always within pulling distance of the finger. But Kent was a weaver, and in a few minutes had the sailor tied hand and foot. Then he dragged him without and laid him by the side of the cabin, where he could overlook the river and watch the sun climb to the meridian. Now I'll give you till noon, and then... What? You'll be hitting the brimstone trail, but if you speak up... I'll keep you till the next bunch of mounted police come by. Well, God blimey if this ain't a go. Ere I be, innocent as a lamb, and ere you be, lost all o' your top amper and out o' your reckoning, run me foul and going to rake me into hellfire. You bloomin' old pirate, you... Jim Cardigie loosed the strings of his profanity and fairly outdid himself. Jacob Kent brought out a stool that he might enjoy it in comfort. Having exhausted all the possible combinations of his vocabulary, the sailor quieted down to hard thinking, his eyes constantly gauging the progress of the sun, which tore up the eastern slope of the heavens with unseemly haste. His dogs, surprised that they had not long since been put to harness, crowded around him. His helplessness appealed to the brutes. They felt that something was wrong, though they knew not what, and they crowded about, howling their mournful sympathy. Chuck, mush on, you swashes, he cried, attempting in a vermicular way to kick at them and discovering himself to be tottering on the edge of a declivity. As soon as the animals had scattered, he devoted himself to the significance of that declivity, which he felt to be there but could not see. Nor was he long in arriving at a correct conclusion. In the nature of things, he figured, man is lazy. He does no more than he has to, when he builds a cabin, he must put dirt on the roof. From these premises, it was logical that he should carry that dirt no further than was absolutely necessary. Therefore, he lay upon the edge of the hole from which the dirt had been taken to roof Jacob Kent's cabin. This knowledge, properly utilized, might prolong things, he thought. And he then turned his attention to the moose-hide thongs which bound him. His hands were tied behind him, and pressing against the snow, they were wet with the contact. This moistening of the rawhide he knew would tend to make it stretch, and, without apparent effort, he endeavored to stretch it more and more. He watched the trail hungrily, and when in the direction of Sixty Mile a dark speck appeared for a moment against the white background of an ice jam, he cast an anxious eye at the sun. It had climbed nearly to the zenith. Now and again he caught the black speck clearing the hills of ice and sinking into the intervening hollows. But he dared not permit himself more than the most cursory glances for fear of rousing his enemy's suspicion. Once, when Jacob Kent rose to his feet and searched the trail with care, Cardigy was frightened, but the dog sled had struck a piece of trail running parallel with a jam and remained out of sight till the danger was past. I'll see you ung for this! Cardigie threatened, attempting to draw the other's attention. And you're rot in hell. Just you see if you don't. I say, he cried after another pause, do ye believe in ghosts? Kent's sudden start made him sure of his ground, and he went on. Now a ghost has the right to haunt a man. What don't do what he says? And ye can't shuffle me off till eight bells. What I mean is twelve o'clock, can you? "'Cause if you do, it'll happen as how I'll haunt you. "'Do ye hear? A minute, a second too quick, "'and I'll haunt you, so help me I will.' "'Jacob Kent looked dubious, but declined to talk. "'How's your chronometer? What's your longitude? "'How do you know as your time's correct?' "'Cardigie persisted, vainly hoping to beat his executioner out of a few minutes. "'Is it barracks time you have?' Or is it the company time? Cause if you do it before the stroke of the bell, I'll not rest. I give you fair warning. I'll come back. And if you haven't the time, how will you know? That's what I want. How will you tell? I'll send you off all right, Kent replied. Got a sundial here. No good. Thirty-two degrees variation of the needle. Stakes are all set. How did you get them? Compass? No, lined them up with the North Star. Sure? Sure. Cardigie groaned, then stole a glance at the trail. The sled was just clearing a rise, barely a mile away, 
and the dogs were in full lope, running lightly. How close is the shadows to the line? Kent walked to the primitive timepiece and studied it. Three inches, he announced after a careful survey. Say, just sing out eight bells afore you pull the gun, will ya? Kent agreed, and they lapsed into silence. The thongs about Cardigie's wrists were slowly stretching, and he had begun to work them over his hands. Say, how close is the shadows? One inch. The sailor wriggled slightly to assure himself that he would topple over at the right moment, and slipped the first turn over his hands. How close? Half an inch. Just then, Kent heard the jarring churn of the runners and turned his eyes to the trail. The driver was lying flat on the sled and the dogs swinging down the straight stretch to the cabin. Kent whirled back, bringing his rifle to shoulder. It ain't eight bells yet, Cardigy expostulated. I'll aunt you, sure, Jacob Kent faltered. He was standing by the sundial, perhaps ten paces from his victim. The man on the sled must have seen that something unusual was taking place, for he had risen to his knees, his whip singing viciously among the dogs. The shadows swept into line. Kent looked along the sights. Make ready, he commanded solemnly. Eight b But just a fraction of a second too soon, Cardigy rolled backward into the hole. Kent held his fire and ran to the edge. Bang! The gun exploded full in the sailor's face as he rose to his feet. But no smoke came from the muzzle. Instead, a sheet of flame burst from the side of the barrel near its butt, and Jacob Kent went down. The dogs dashed up the bank, dragging the sled over his body, and the driver sprang off as Jim Cardigy freed his hands and drew himself from the hole. Jim! The newcomer recognized him. What's the matter? What's the matter? Oh, nothing at all. It just happens as I do little things like this for my elf. What's the matter, you bloomin' idiot? What's the matter, eh? Cast me loose or I'll show you what. Hurry up or I'll only stone the decks with you. Huh, he added as the other went to work with his sheath knife. What's the matter? I want to know. Just tell me that, will ya? What's the matter, hey? Kent was quite dead when they rolled him over. The gun, an old-fashioned, heavy-weighted muzzle loader, lay near him. Steel and wood had parted company. Near the butt of the right-hand barrel, with lips pressed outward, gaped a fissure several inches in length. The sailor picked it up curiously. A glittering stream of yellow dust ran through the crack. The facts of the case dawned upon Jim Cardigy. Strike me standin', he roared. Ears ya go, ears is bloomin' dust. God blimey, and you too, Charlie, if you don't run and get the dishpan. End of the man with the gash.